Luke 15. I um, was reading a list of stories of people sharing embarrassing moments from their life. And uh, I read a story of someone who was talking about when they were a, a child, I don't know how old, but they were at a playground, at a park, playing with the other children. And uh, a woman who was uh, there uh, announced, okay, everyone come get ice cream now. And so this person, as they related it, uh, as a child, you know, they... They went and they, they ran over and joined the, the group of other children to get ice cream. Uh, and what they didn't realize is that there was a, a large family gathering at the park, and most of the other children there were uh, cousins, and you know they were all related to one another, part of the family. And the woman was only talking to the people in her family that were there, and uh, wasn't it wasn't just offering ice cream to every child in the park. She was just you know assuming that it just the ones connected to her would come. And this child, you know, got in the group and then they were told, oh, it was, it was just for these children. And of course they felt silly and embarrassed. And they might have felt something like some of these sinners and tax collectors who were gathering to hear Jesus. When these Pharisees were muttering and complaining, this man welcomed sinners and eats with them. They were disgusted with Jesus because tax collectors were considered some of the worst people in that society. They were considered to be traitors and greedy. And of course, the other term, uh, sinners, was just a way of des describing people who were looked down on because of their, of their sinful behaviors, whatever it might have been. They were uh, you know, perhaps uh, drunkards or immoral or, or something else. And um, the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders of the, the day, uh, they were known for being uh, the rule followers. They were the ones who were holy as far as everybody was concerned. And they did not approve of Jesus receiving sinners and tax collectors and eating with them. To, to sit down and eat with someone signified your acceptance of that person. Come and have some ice cream with me, you know, maybe the woman at the park could have said. Uh, in that culture, it was that way. In our own culture, it's often that way. If you want to extend friendship, let's have a meal together. That's one way of extending friendship and acceptance. And Jesus was heard gladly by the people. Even, even the people who weren't accepted in polite society, Jesus would go and sit down with them and share a meal with them and, and indicate by that that they were welcome in His presence. He accepted them. And so these Pharisees and the teachers of the law are grumbling. He welcomes them. He eats with them. And so we're told in verse 3 of Luke 15, Jesus tells them this parable. And it's interesting. It says He tells them this parable. And what follows are what we would have thought of as three parables. The, the story of the lost sheep. The story of the lost coin. The story of the lost son. But really, they are all one. They're like a three-part story. Or a story with, with three different facets to it. And a key theme in the story, you might have noticed, is the words lost and found. Okay, verse, verse 6. Uh, the shepherd calls together his friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. And then the woman in verse 10, or verse uh, 9, says to her friends and neighbors, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. And then the father uh, celebrates. And um, what does he say? Uh, verse 24, the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And Jesus is 
telling these three stories, which were all really one big story, to, to teach a lesson about the attitude of the Father to the, the welcomed sinner. Because what does he say? There's rejoicing in heaven. Rejoicing in heaven over one sinner. Rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner. So Jesus is telling these stories to show us God's attitude to sinners who come to Him. But the story has a hook. It has a twist at the end that we'll come to in a few minutes. We're going to focus tonight, though, simply on that third story, the, the story of the lost son. And we'll, we'll need to say at the very beginning, this is actually not a story about one lost son. It's a story about two lost sons. And at the end, only one of them is no longer lost. You have the rebellious son beginning there in verse 11. This man has two sons and the younger one says to his father, give me my share of the estate. So um, in that culture, usually the older son would have received a double portion. So in this situation, likely the father divided his uh, estate into two, into three parts and gave the older two to the older son who stayed home and gave the value of the third portion to the younger son. And, and really for the younger son to ask for this was not far off from being a traitor to the family. You know, for him to say to his dad, I want my inheritance now was, was, all, was not far from saying, dad, I wish you were dead. I, I want your money. I want your wealth but I don't want you. And he demonstrated that attitude because after he received his inheritance, he goes off far away, doesn't he? He went off to a distant country. And not only did he go far off, but he, but he wasted all of, all of the money that he had received, all the wealth that he'd been given. And it says he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, you can imagine the, uh, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law as they're listening to Jesus tell this story. Uh, and perhaps they were shaking their head in disgust at this point because so far in the story, this younger son is the villain. He's foolish. He's making a, a wreck of his life, squandering his wealth in wild living. But... He comes to his senses, doesn't he? Verse 17 tells us that. He came to his senses after hitting rock bottom, becoming a, a, a hired worker and being sent out to feed pigs, which in Jewish culture, if you were a, a swine herder, you were really considered to be a cursed person. I mean, it couldn't be any worse for you than to be out feeding pigs. Pigs were unclean animals. In, in, from the Jewish, from the standpoint of the Old Testament and Jewish culture. But he, he, after he hits rock bottom, he comes to his senses. And you know, this often, perhaps I don't know this room well enough, but maybe there's someone here that that's part of your story. Maybe, maybe in your life, you made a lot of bad choices and really made a wreck of things before you came to faith in Christ. That's, that's often the case. Uh, there are many, you know, many, many people, they, they don't have that experience as Christians. Maybe they're kept from those types of things and they learn about God's grace in other ways. But sometimes there are people that um, they go out and taste all that the world has to offer and they find out that it, it doesn't make for a nice life in the end. It makes for a hard life. And they hit rock bottom. And they come to their senses by the grace of God. That's what's happening to this younger son. Verse 17. He comes to his senses. And he realizes that uh, even though he thought he was going to go out and live the good life. Uh, he may have for a while. But in the end, he's, he is starving. And, 
and even the servants back home, uh, his father's hired men, have food to eat while he's starving. And so he resolves to return. And, and really in verses 18 and 19, in a, in a way, he really sets forth here a picture of, of real humility and repentance. He says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went off to his father. Uh, in some ways, he's, he's really showing us a picture of repentance. Because you see that he's, he's willing to acknowledge that he sinned. Right? I mean, that's, if someone, if someone won't, just won't even admit that they've sinned, it's hard to think that they're really actually sorry. Um, you know, how, how often are we treated to apologies by politicians and celebrities? And they amount to, uh, well, um, if you were offended, I'm sorry you were offended. Um, but they don't ever actually just say, no, I was wrong, I was totally wrong, I shouldn't have done what I did, shouldn't have said what I said, I regret doing it, I shouldn't have done it, I'm sorry. Like, we don't often hear that, do we? It's hard to say things like that. Why do you think that is? Well, pride is probably one of the biggest reasons. Fear of consequences would be another reason. So the son says, I'm going to go back and say this. I've sinned against heaven and against you. Although partly in what he says here, he shows his misunderstanding of his father. His idea is that he's, he's sure he's lost all standing with his father. He's sure that if there's any chance of him being received back home at all, he's going to have to accept a, a lower place. He's going to have to come back as a hired servant. In his mind, that was the best that he could hope for. And it may be that his view of his father and, for, and the kind of forgiveness he might receive is, is kind of like some of us. We often act like we think the way into God's favor is by cleaning ourselves up or doing something that we think will show God or others that we're worthy of His acceptance. We're uncomfortable with the idea that there's nothing we can do to rescue ourselves. Nothing we can do to, to, to deserve forgiveness. And that is the message of the Gospel, isn't it? That, that we are all sinners. And, and left to ourselves, we are deserving of judgment. And there is no escape from this. There's no way to reform ourselves. There's no way to, to change ourselves so that somehow God will forgive us and take us back. That's hard to, to face up to. At the end of the day, we are beggars in need of grace. Undeserved favor. There's no call in the gospel to, to rescue our own reputation or, or salvage our dignity. And the listening Pharisees would have approved of this approach. As they hear Jesus talk about this disgraceful son who says, I'm going to go back and say I'm not worthy to be your son. Just let me be one of your hired men. They would have listened and thought, you know, that's about right. That would be pretty generous of that father to let that son come back as a, as a house, as a, as a servant, not as a son. That'd be pretty nice of the fall. Pretty generous. But as the story goes on, there's a, a surprise in store for this son. And what happens next, while it may have shocked the son, it probably also shocked the listeners to Jesus, these Pharisees and teachers of the law. What happens when he returns? Well, we see verse 20. He got up and went to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. 
he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And, and really, everything the father does here would have been completely unexpected in Jesus' day and culture. This is not how dignified, righteous living fathers behave towards sons who throw away their wealth on wild living. This father extends to the son an unconditional welcome. His response is immediate, enthusiastic, and generous. He runs and embraces him and and kisses him. And in this culture, the, the, the patriarch, the father of the house, would, would never have acted like this in public. That would have been thought of as very undignified for the, the, the head of a, a large, wealthy family like they have with, with land and property and servants to go running down the road with his, with his nice robes and all of his dignity to just go running down the road to this disgraceful son. That is not how things worked in that culture. But the father isn't worried about decorum. He's not worried about protocol. He's not worried about tradition or culture. He sees his son and he runs to welcome him. The son doesn't deserve this. It's cost the father a great deal what the son has done. It's cost the family a great deal what he has done. There's been not just financial loss, but the emotional pain of seeing this son go off and disappear. And they thought he was lost. They thought he was dead. And now here he comes back in his rags, in his shame. And the father runs to welcome him. And in this culture, people might have expected this son to be shamed. And then shunned. You don't deserve to be here. You don't belong here anymore. Get out. This father does not even allow his son to finish his speech of repentance. You, you'll notice um, in verse 21. The son gets through the first part of what, he's going to, what he had planned to say. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But before you can get to the bit about uh, I'm not, uh, make me like one of your hired servants, the father cuts him off. He, he's, he's heard enough. He knows his son is coming back and he's repentant and he's welcoming him back. To insist on returning as a servant would have been an insult to the father's generosity. And so the father believes that this occasion calls for nothing less than a lavish celebration. Look at the the welcome he, he gives his son. Verse 22, the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. And all of these elements have meaning, really. To, to give him a robe would have been a mark of honor. The, the, the servants don't get robes. The hired men, however much they would have been appreciated or how well they would have paid, they didn't get robes. That was something for the family. It was a mark of honor. He gets a ring, probably a a signet ring, showing he that he was a member of the family with the authority and standing of a son and heir of the family. To give him a robe and a ring is to say, you are are back to where you belong. You You are restored back to everything that you walked away from. To put sandals on his feet would have been a luxury in that day. We're all wearing shoes of some kind tonight, I think, but... In that culture, to have sandals on your feet was a a bit of a luxury. Apparently, he was barefoot when he arrived. And so the father is is simply taking steps to completely restore this son. There's no mistaking him for a servant. There's no mistaking him for a beggar that's just showed up on the doorstep. He's clearly 
restored back to his place in the family. The place that he walked away from. The place that he threw away in his selfishness and pride and greed. And the Father is handing it all to him on a platter. Speaking of platters, he kills the fattened cow. This was something um, extravagant. Even for a wealthy family, this would have been uh, extravagant. It's, it's, feast, it's time for a feast. And the gospel reminds us that there is another father who paid a deep cost in order to welcome the sinners. We're meant to see God's grace in the picture of the father. And honestly, really, for those of you that are Christians, uh, you probably know this, but this is one of the hardest lessons to learn as a Christian, is that God really is this generous. And He doesn't stop being this generous. It's not that He saves the lost sinner and then says, okay, well now, from now on, you've got to prove that you belong here. This is His attitude towards sinners who come to Him. It is one of welcome, of, of lavish generosity, it is one of acceptance. He says to you, you are mine. You're, you're my child. You belong with me now. <laughs> Very often in our telling of this story, uh, we end right here. It's a happy ending. The father celebrating the return of his lost son. But you'll notice the story continues. And that is because there is this hook, there's this twist in the story to highlight our desperate need of understanding and accepting the truth that God is generous. And this might, this might arouse in us. Uh, it, it, might, it might show us that there, there may be some 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 misunderstandings planted deep in your heart when you, when you read the rest of the story. There's actually more than one rebellious son. There's more than one rebellious son. The, the, the first son, the younger son, I mean, we, I said at the beginning, to, to demand your inheritance and then to leave with it. It was basically to, to say you want your father dead. He had a problem with his father. And he left with his part of the inheritance. But this other son, he's got a problem with his father as well. He's not celebrating. He's angry. Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. He calls one of the servants and asks him what's going on. And the servant tells him, verse 28, the older brother is angry and refuses to go in. I want no part of this, he says. I am not joining this party. And in keeping with what's happened in this story where the father is, is really... Uh, violating all the cultural norms, uh, he, he, he goes out to the son. Now, you, have to, you have to get the picture here. This is, a, this is the, the father of the family, a dignified, respected man. And for the, the son to say, I'm not going in there, I'm not joining that party, it was an insult to the father. And yet the father goes out and pleads with him. That, that you would not see that happening in Jesus' day. And those of you that even to this day, if you're familiar with Middle Eastern culture, fathers don't go plead with their sons. They have too much dignity and authority in that culture. But here the father is pleading with the son. The father, he has a heart for the younger son, and he has a heart for the older son, and he's, he's pleading with him. And how does, the, how does the son respond? Well, what does he say? Verse 29, All these years 
I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Well, the younger son had a problem with his father and he left. The older son has just realized that he's actually not on good terms with the father either. You might have assumed, oh, well, he's the good one. He didn't leave. He stayed. And he worked and he served and he stayed with the father and kept, kept the family business going, kept the farm going. But now we learn that all along, he thinks he's been slaving, unrewarded. Slaving, unrewarded. You might have thought, oh, he's, he's content to be with the Father. What a lovely position to be in. The other son has broken the, the father's heart and gone off and embarrassed the family. But this is the, the good son. He's, he's doing everything he should do. No, nothing to criticize there. He's, he's fulfilling his duty. But in his heart, he's saying, I have to do this. I'm slaving away and I'm not getting anything for it. That was his attitude. The younger son thought he could get what he wanted by rebelling. He was selfish and in it only for himself. The older son, he thought he could get what he wanted by obeying. But he was also selfish and in it for himself. And I think sometimes this reveals what's going on in the heart of the, the person who there's nothing to criticize about them. They're, they're a fine of standing. Person. Maybe they even go to church. And yet in their hearts, they're not thinking, I have a wonderful father and I'm welcome in his home. They're thinking, I have to do this. And I'm not getting anything out of it. That was the attitude of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He has a warped view of his place in that family. And we realize that both sons have a problem. One of them has come to his senses and has come into the welcome of the Father. The other one is outside. To the, to the casual onlooker, he looks like the good one. But he is lost. He, he has an inflated sense of his own righteousness. You see that in verse 29? He says, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. That's kind of hard to believe, really. And here I need to reveal that I'm an older brother. I'm the oldest of three sons. I was often thought of as the good one and the responsible one. And I can promise you there were plenty of times I disobeyed my parents' orders. And they just didn't know. They did know sometimes. But plenty of times I was the good one. But people didn't really know. Didn't really know what I was up to. And this son has an inflated sense of his own righteousness. Certainly compared to the younger son, in many ways he's better, right? He didn't go off and squander all of the father or a third of the estate on wild living, did he? He, he was responsible. He did his job. But he's not perfect. He has this inflated sense of his own righteousness. He's just picking and choosing the ways that he's better. And he has a distorted view of the father's generosity. You never gave me, he says. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. All this generosity is on display for the younger brother. And, and, the, and the, the first thing, the bro, one of the first things the brother says is, you didn't do this for me. You didn't even give me anything close to that. They're getting so much more. He's getting so much more than I've ever 
he has a distorted view of the Father's generosity. This must be getting pretty close to home by now with the Pharisees who resented Christ's welcome of sinners and outcasts. The older brother resented the generous grace of the Father to the Son. What did he need to learn? Grace and generosity and redemption are worth celebrating. For the Son to join in the celebration would show His approval of the Father's kindness and generosity. So who's in the worst position? The younger son who's hit rock bottom and now returned to the embrace and welcome of the Father? Or the older son who has everything? And yet is cut off from the Father's house. Cut off from the welcome of the Father. The Father responds to in verse 31, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. If he divided, the Father divided the estate into three parts and gave one to the younger son and held the other two for the older son, it's true, everything there belongs to that son. He's standing in the middle of his own fortune. And says, you have a good name. And the Father is saying, everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. And this story ends with an appeal. Verse 32, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And the real punchline of the story really is found in the one telling the story. This has been all about lost things being found. The shepherd goes and looks for the lost sheep and brings him home. The woman goes and sweeps the house and finds the lost coin and takes it back to herself and celebrates. And then you have a lost son and no one went looking. But we can know that there is, a, there is truly a better elder brother. Not the one in the story, but the one who seeks and saves the lost. Jesus joyfully did the will of the Father to bring the lost back to the Father. He's the shepherd who seeks the lost sheep. And where we should have been shamed and shut out from the Father's presence, Jesus Himself went to the cross and endured our shame and experienced the wrath of His Father against our sin. Where we should have been shamed and shunned, actually He was shamed and shunned so we could be welcomed. The end of the story really leaves us with this question, will you receive the grace of the Father? And secondly, if you've received God's grace, are you enjoying God's grace? Are you happy to see other people receive God's grace? It's hard to believe, even as Christians. I've been a Christian for 30 years, over 30 years now. And it's hard to believe sometimes that God would celebrate and rejoice over me. And welcome me. And not hold anything, any of my many sins against me. But he does. And he does for you as well. If you believe in his son. If you trust in Jesus Christ. You are welcomed and loved and embraced. And your, present, and your, your place in God's family is celebrated. Not because of who you are in yourself, but because of what Christ has done for you. If you are a Christian, there is nothing better that could happen to you than that you would trust in Jesus Christ. Forsake your, good, your own goodness. Repent of the idea that, that you can somehow earn God's favor on your own. And turn to Jesus Christ, the one who suffered and died in the place of sin. If you are a believer, turn your heart and your thoughts frequently to the fact that God welcomes you. God rejoices over you. You are welcomed in His house forever.
Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your welcome. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who died to save us. We pray in his name. Amen. We're going to finish by singing probably a familiar hymn to you. Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as a flood. <laughs>